Self-control is the chief element in self-respect, and self-respect is the chief element in courage. This it is. What is now proved was only once imagined. William Blake. In 2014, there was an uproar in the Middle East. A group of Iraqi and Syrian men who would later become ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and Libya, and or IS, the Islamic State, came onto the world scene. Their rampages were highlighted writ large, their brutality second to none, notorious for public executions, decapitations, execution of anybody who defied them, journalists, contractors, Iraqi soldiers, and ordinary civilians, just to name a few, and the rape and sale of the girls and women they'd captured along the way made them a force to be reckoned with. This offshoot of Al-Qaeda, who had since disowned them, given their extreme brutality, made the latter look tame in comparison. At the same time, they formed a group of Kurdish female freedom fighters who began to hold IS at bay in the small Syrian town of Kobain. These freedom fighters were relentless. They were convinced that IS was afraid of them because if a fighter were to die at the hands of a woman, they wouldn't inherit heaven. These women were convinced that their reason for their success at holding IS off was the power of their indomitable will. They said that their will could not be budged and that IS could never compete with their determination. Driving IS from Cobain was top priority. Hello and welcome to the second chapter of my book, Minding the Brain Towards Change. This chapter is entitled Willpower. And what you just heard was an extract of the beginning of the chapter. I'm going to dive in and continue reading this chapter. So if you haven't already heard what comes before it in chapter one in addiction, head on over to the previous chapter. Although what you'll hear today can stand on its own. So if you're interested in jumping right in to discuss the concept of willpower and hear about it and see how it applies to you, check on in and we'll go from there. But without further ado, let's continue on back into the book. Observing the happenings in the Middle East, especially the territories plagued by warfare, an outsider might perceive each day a battle for survival. Without the will to live, survival cannot be an outcome. I bring my mind to the heart-wrenching story of little Omran Daknish, who was quietly enjoying a meal with his family in the city of Aleppo in Syria when explosions turned their house into a pile of grey rubble. He was strenuously pulled out by emergency services and carried into a nearby ambulance. It was here that the five-year-old sat with a blank look on his blood-stained and dirt-smeared face, focused on the camera, traumatised. You can think of many familiar stories that splash against our television screens each day, stories of survival and horror. Contrasting our Western world with places where life can only be preserved through the daily fight of survival, a large disparity appears in my perception. Some in the West label struggles as the inability to achieve a great and a quick enough internet connection having to throw away an empty milk carton found in the fridge or having to wait the oh-so-dreaded time of six months for their favourite television show to roll over to a new season. These struggles that have come to be known as first world problems would be laughable if only they weren't so stupid. Meanwhile, those in third world countries, or as the writer and Christian missionary K.P. Johan puts it, the two-thirds world, Praise their God or gods for all they have, which is often as little as $3 a day can buy. Here in the West, we seem to be a consumerist society that's geared more towards pleasure than self-discipline and the building of character. One tends to be more excited about the new, novel, different than anything else. Often, it's a person's focus on pleasure in the here and now, at the expense of future breadth and development that puts them at a loss. 
the will to strive towards a valued goal, as seen with the Kurdish women fighting IS, colors what we do each day. Striving towards a value-based goal is part and parcel of human existence. But for some, thinking about what their values are is just not on the radar. Enter the Values in Action VIA project. The VIA project was an initiative that surveyed people globally and asked them to rate themselves on their own greatest personal strengths. Roy Baumeister and science writer John Tierney referred to the VIA survey in their book, Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength. They said that of all the character strengths identified in the project, for example, kindness, creativity, honesty, and so on, Self-control, or regulation, as it was phrased in the VIA project, came in dead last. What's interesting, though, is that whenever a person fails at kindness, creativity, or honesty, they do so because they lack a certain regulation. They lack self-regulation. You can't have one without the other. You need to knuckle down and set aside time to be creative. For honesty, you must forego sensitivity in favor of authenticity. The same is true for kindness. To live out the values you admire, you need willpower. Baumeister wrote that the two greatest predictors of overall quality of life are intelligence and self-control. Try as you might, intelligence is seldom increased through psychological methodology. Willpower, or self-control on the other hand, has been shown to increase with practice. Let's look at this in terms of goals. Baumeister and Tierney introduced the difference between distal goals and proximal goals. When distal goals, that is long-term goals, are set and worked towards, the person is more likely to see their current efforts, that is their proximal goals, as contributing to the big picture. When goals are clear, you can put your foot forward and achieve them. Baumeister and Tierney wrote the book on willpower, quite literally. This chapter draws on willpower research in order to understand what willpower is, its physiological constituents, and why it matters. You'll also learn about self-control and self-regulation, later applied to addiction and recovery. So, let's pose a question. What is willpower? Willpower defined. In the previous chapter, I defined willpower as the energy behind self-control. But what does this even mean? What energy are we talking about? And how, like those courageous Kurds, Can we foster this will, this energy to work towards our goals? I want to turn to this now. Baumeister and Tierney thought that Freud was onto something when discussing the energy model of the self. Footnote. The energy model of the self is a model in psychoanalytic theory that contends quote-unquote psychic energy is released and directed to an object, for example a person. As a result, emotions are attributed to this object depending on its importance. From a neurological standpoint, we can understand this process by invoking a part of the brain called the insula. The insula works in tandem with the environment to scan and, if appropriate, mirror another person's emotions. An example could be smiling when your boyfriend is smiling. This process is facilitated by a bunch of neurons called mirror neurons that are contained within the insular region of the brain and, in a very real sense, serve as the foundation for empathy and emotional maturity. Let's go back to the book. So, Baumeister and Tierney thought that Freud was onto something with this theory. Though Freud might have been mistaken in terms of his sublimation theory, that is, when there is a conversion of energy from its basic instinctual sources into more socially approved ones, that's what he talks about when he talks about sublimation theory, he might have been right about the body using some sort of energy when deciding on certain tasks. Enter the energy behind self-control. One definition psychologists have used to describe willpower is, quote, the ability to carry out one's intention, unquote. Self-control, on the other hand, has been understood as a general outcome of the will. In Willpower, Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength, as cited before, Baumeister and Tierney highlight the importance of willpower and self-control for life's successes. Furthermore, in an article from the American Psychological Association concerning willpower, willpower was described 
as the ability to delay gratification, resisting short-term temptations in order to meet long-range goals. In order to meet, rather, long-term goals. That was a quote from the APA. To self-regulation research Denise DeRuda and her colleagues, self-control represents the ability to regulate one's behavior, thoughts, and emotions in such a way that gives one strength over impulsivity, that is, giving in to temptation. Willpower and self-control are used interchangeably in the psychological literature. This makes sense from a behavioral point of view and for the behavioral sciences. To create a distinction between the two, I will call willpower the energy behind self-control and self-control the ability to withstand temptation for long-term goal achievement. A little bit of a segue here, whether or not you're defining these precisely or not, uh, in day-to-day life doesn't really matter. We kind of use these terms really interchangeably, self-control, self-regulation, willpower, all that sort of stuff. You're not going to be uh, splitting hairs with this sort of stuff. But from a research point of view, I guess this is what we're talking about when we think about how these concepts are studied and what kind of words are used. So if you're just listening to this and saying, why is Emil just splitting hairs over here? That's kind of the reason because we'll get into physiology, we'll get into the research backed. But let's just consider this as uh, whether we're talking about willpower, whether we're talking about self-control, uh, self-regulation, they pretty much mean the same thing uh, when it comes down to practicality of the whole thing. Let's go back to the book. The Physiology of Willpower. Back in the mid-2000s, the social psychologist Matt Galliott teamed up with Baumeister to investigate the concept of willpower physiologically. The pair found that glucose, which is a simple carb that acts as energy in the body, especially the brain, played an important role as willpower fuel. The body needs glucose for energy, and this is especially important in the brain. Although, quote, the precise physiological mechanisms behind how glucose levels influence self-control are unknown at present, end quote, what is known is that the release of glucose is an important factor in the exercise of self-control. To explain these findings, it pays to get a little more technical. The prefrontal cortex, which is an area located on the surface of the cortex just behind your eyes, and more importantly, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a part of the frontal lobe around the same area of the prefrontal cortex, just a little bit deeper, experience heightened activity when a person is exercising their self-control. Among other things, these areas of the brain are responsible for emotional regulation and decision-making. In regulating emotions and making decisions, the brain relies on energy. To be precise, glucose. Glucose is taken in by the food you eat and metabolized. That means broken down and passed around through the body. To, quote, brain regions needed to carry out a particular task, end quote. Now, you can find out a little bit more on willpower and its physiology in Galeot and Baumeister's 2007 uh, article, The Physiology of Willpower. This is where I'm getting a lot of this material from. So if you want to hear a little bit more about that, type The Physiology of Willpower into Google, uh, Galeot and Baumeister 2007, and you can go from there. Back to the book. This simple sugar controls the way the brain performs its vital functions. In the brain, glucose is converted into neurotransmitters, and when glucose metabolism isn't at its optimum, the brain cannot function the way it's meant to. When you take in enough glucose through the food you consume, you reach what I'll call glucose homeostasis. This preferential level of maintenance allows you to perform the tasks you need to. To paint a clearer picture of how this looks like metabolically, consider the following. You eat a nutritious meal and glucose levels in your blood rise. 
Insulin is released from the pancreas, which is a digestive and hormone releasing organ found in the abdomen, to lower these levels. A few hours after the meal, you experience a drop in blood glucose levels. That's when the pancreas releases glucogen into the blood, the liver releases glucose again, and the levels go back to normal. Glucose homeostasis is reached. Now, at this time, you might be asking yourself, why is any of this in any way important for addiction? Well, as we'll see, when glucose metabolism is acting up, such as in conditions like diabetes, hyperglycemia, or substance use and abuse, your self-control is significantly impaired. We're going to jump on into this in the next section. Effects of blood glucose levels on behavior. In any activity that requires you to exert self-control, energy is a must. To paint a clearer picture, this section looks at how glucose metabolism relates to attention, emotion, crime, aggression, and violence, impulsivity, consumption of alcohol and cigarettes, and stress. It's quite a lot of things, but let's get into it because we're going to break these down and make them a bit more applicable for those who are interested. Number one. Attention. As we've already seen, the more you pay attention to something, the more glucose is consumed. One study measured glucose levels in the bloodstream when a person was paying attention to a particular task. It was found that once people extended their attention initially, they performed much worse on subsequent activities that required their attention and self control. Now, the studies that I'm going to, or the study that I'm going to cite here is performed by Galia and his colleagues in 2007, and it's titled, Self-Control Relies on Glucose as a Limited Energy Source. So if you're interested in that, type in that title and you'll get more on the, the mechanics of what I'm going to be speaking about now. Let's go back to the book. Using up self-control in one task, for example, holding your breath, doing something strenuous, even though your body feels like it needs to stop, so just pushing that extra level forward, to any, pretty much any task that requires you to use up some self-control. Using up self-control in one task affects your ability to perform another task with similar effort. So the more you extend energy in one task, Hello, hello, it's a pretty no-brainer. The less energy you're going to have for the next task. The study that I cited before, they, the researchers looked at participants who were given a glucose drink, something like cordial, before taking part in a task requiring the spending of energy and attention. Then they were asked to pay attention to some puzzles. Another group of people were asked to pay attention without having consumed glucose beforehand. Those who consumed glucose did much better than those who hadn't received the beverage. In this study, glucose consumption contributed to higher levels of attention. The application of this to daily life is enormous. Think about those diagnosed, think about those diagnosed with diabetes and hyperglycemia. In Populations where glucose metabolism is affected, self-control is significantly strained. Their condition affects glucose metabolism in the bloodstream, reaching homeostatic levels. When you can't metabolize glucose, you can't pay attention as well as you might. So when your body's spent, you're not able to pay much attention. This is why after a sport of some sort, your brain is a whole lot lazier than it could have been beforehand, especially when it's in the recovery phase. So I think this is really important. But also with diabetes and hyperglycemia, uh, you have an interruption with blood glucose levels and all that sort of stuff. So these uh, people who are diagnosed with diabetes and low blood sugar levels, they might be a bit less attentive, a bit more susceptible to to frustration and aggressive tendencies, but we'll get to that in in a moment. Now, this is by no means saying that people who are di have diabetes or have gly hyperglycemia are aggressive and in and more likely to get angry. It's just some some correlates that we've seen 
uh, up until this point. So I want to be careful there. Number two, emotion. Research has found that the more you spend time exerting self-control in a particular task, the less able you are to control your emotions. Take me, for example. Uh, many years ago, the morning after I'd been on a weekend bender, I slept on an Adam Sandler movie called Click. This movie wasn't meant to be a tearjerker. It was about a guy who'd been given a remote that could fast forward, rewind, pause and skip parts of his life at the click of a button. Thing is, the remote was smart. He remembered his choices for next time. What had originally been the opportunity to skip a kid's tantrum, the remote had morphed into him missing vast chunks of his kids' lives. The same for other members of his family. One scene in particular hit me hard. It was when the remote skipped his last conversation with his dejected father. Adam Sandler's character didn't feel like talking when approached by his father and so the remote skipped the scene. Only later, when he's given the opportunity to review the interaction, does he see the folly. This was the last time he was going to see his father. At this scene, I cried like a baby. This would be unremarkable if for the fact I'd rarely cry. Less so when I'm watching films. But let's consider the factors leading up to me watching the movie. First, it was a morning after getting drunk. I was already at subprime. Second, my attempt to fight back the tears initially, this would have been an exercise of willpower, depleting my glucose availability. Once this came to a head, the floodgates released. I could no longer hold back the tears. Gellier and Baumeister's research found that people who have higher, quote, anxiety, irritability, tension, and other bad moods, end quote, tend to have lower levels of blood glucose. Their expenditure of the will leads to a depletion of energy. Thus, emotion kicks in. The more you try to suppress something, the more likely you are to experience emotional dysregulation. Let's think about this practically speaking. The more you hold in your emotions, the more energy you're using to hold in your emotions and the more likely for these emotions to come out in ways that you do not want them to come out. So it's not really helpful at all times, clinically or just uh, speaking generally, to hold things in until your cup gets full. This is where that uh, consideration comes from, holding, holding yourself in until you explode. Important stuff. Number three. Crime, aggression, and violence. Most crimes committed aren't meticulously planned out, but acts of impulse. I'm going to give you a bit of a side note here. It's a really amazing book written by the uh, aggression and psychopathy researcher uh, Adrian Rain, R-A-I-N-E. He's a British researcher who wrote a book, The Anatomy of Violence, what he found there in that book was that there's many different types of violent exercises or experiences that are conducted by people in a heat of passion compared to people who are meticulously planning these things out. Now, this makes the difference between psychopathy and sociopathy. And one of the things I want to really hone in on is a number of interviews that I've conducted with another researcher for this podcast, and his name is James Fallon. So James Fallon goes into the nitty gritty of the difference between psychopaths and sociopaths. But in essence, what's going to be interesting in this part of the chapter is that the brain regions associated with psychopathy and sociopathy are very different. So when we think of most crimes that are committed are not meticulously planned out, but acts of impulse, we see crimes of passion. We see sociopathic crimes, people who uh, don't necessarily control their impulses, but act in ways that are denigrative to society. People who know what they're doing isn't crash hot, but they get overcome with emotion. This is really important, the emotional element, whereas psychopaths can still be a menace to society, most often are in very interesting ways, but they can do this very 
calmly, uh, collectedly, and they don't show as much emotion. In fact, their emotional circuitry in their brains are not as uh, and not as developed in terms of linking to emotion as an ordinary person, for example. I thought that'd be an interesting side note, but I would highly, highly recommend the book by Adrian Rain, The Anatomy of Violence, for more on this sort of stuff. And if you want a bit of a rundown on psych- psychopaths, the first few episodes on my podcast has a lot on that. But let's get back to the book. There's a correlation between low blood glucose and impulsivity. In fact, one study measuring blood glucose levels among 129 prisoners found that about 90% were depleted. In my clinical practice, many passed through on court orders because of stupid stuff they'd done while drunk or high. In one unit of professional development delivered by forensic psychologists, it was found that over 30% of criminals were intoxicated at the time of their offense. Ice being one of the more uh, used substances in the notorious, ice being methamphetamine. This is unsurprising if you think of it. Methamphetamine is well known for impairing prefrontal functioning, therefore leading to lapses in self-control and regulation. I want to have another side note here because it, it is widely known that the dopamine release in methamphetamine is much higher than in many other drugs. In fact, when there are researchers measuring the units of dopamine compared to things like crack cocaine, uh, there have been studies that that uh, indicate crack cocaine releases roughly around 300 units of dopamine, whereas methamphetamine releases something like 1,200 units of dopamine. Now, I haven't looked into this too deeply, so I can't give you too much uh, context on that. And from a clinical perspective, uh, I'm not a researcher, but I can give you a bit of an understanding of what I've come across in some of the research and people infinitely smarter than I am at looking at these nuances. Uh, What I want to say is that the prefrontal region, so that part just behind your forehead, uh, more, more, uh, understandably, the part behind your eyes is that part that throws attention, that regulates behavior. These sorts of areas are not as well functioning in many people who are using methamphetamine. And so if we see a dysregulation in this part of the brain, we often see people who are who are really putting the substance, the thing that feeds the more visceral experience, they're, they're putting this parts much higher in terms of value than their family members, their obligations, their work. And so we can see a difference in how they process and approach life. And this can be really tricky because then they don't, they don't actually feel the need to, to change their behavior because they're not thinking it through as much. And it's very hard for a person to change a behavior until they hit rock bottom. That's been a a lot of my clinical experience often people have to hit rock bottom for them to make any changes in their behavior. Let's go back to the book. Number four, impulsivity. There are differences in impulsivity when comparing men with women. Men with low blood glucose levels are more impulsive than those with optimal levels. The same isn't so with women. Men with hyperglycemia and diabetes see an increase in impulsivity across the board. Think of a bad-tempered and explosively impulsive grandfather. He might appear discontent, emotional, dysregulated, and abrupt when his blood sugar levels are out of whack. I want to rest on this just for a little bit because here we have sex differences between men and women. And this sex difference uh, was identified in the Physiology of Willpower, that paper that Baumeister and Galia wrote. So this is an interesting finding that even men, men with hyperglycemia compared to women with hyperglycemia, you see some differences there where women don't tend to act as impulsively as men do when they're experiencing that. Number five, alcohol. When you consume alcohol, given metabolism, sorry, glucose metabolism rather, all but halts throughout the brain and body. 
Even enjoying a glass of two of fine wine after a palatable meal drops glucose to suboptimal levels. What's confounding is that self-control isn't only impaired once you're drunk. But your initial decision to start drinking might have been brought about by low blood glucose levels in the first place. The low levels beget a lapse in self-control. A person with low self-control is more likely to accept a drink when offered and to get drunk. When drunk, they're more likely to act impulsively. When glucose levels are back to normal, say by eating well and drinking water, they're more likely to restrain themselves. Number six, cigarettes. In 1991, about 24.3% of Australians smoked daily, about one quarter of the population back then. By 2012, only 16% of the population smoked daily, about 2.7 million people. In 2013, the number of daily smokers decreased to only 12.8%, a little more than 1 in 10 people. By 2019, only 1 in 10 people smoked. Cigarette smoking had been decreasing significantly over the past 25 years. The problem is, smoking still claims more lives today than almost any other disease in Australia, according to accounting for 21% of all cancer deaths. This is remarkable. Is there a link between cigarette smoking and blood glucose levels? By now you've already guessed that there is, and you'd be right. When low, the body craves cigarettes. When high, there's less craving. Number seven, stress. Everybody gets stressed and anxious at some point. It might be when you're worried about a loved one's medical condition, your kid's rehearsal or performance in a sport, an upcoming interview, or watching your back when you're walking down the road. Observing stress physiologically, we see the body converting stored energy into glucose and releasing it into the bloodstream, thereby thereby increasing the flow of glucose to the brain. This is especially important when considering our cognitive faculties. Your ability to think when in a bind is primary to escaping impending doom. In fact, pessimists usually experience an increase in cerebral glucose levels, that is, glucose metabolism in the surface area of the brain, indicating more effort directed towards coping with a particular stressor. The more stressed you are, the harder your brain must work to manage the perceived threat. The more glucose is expended, the more likely for it to deplete. This is bad news for those under chronic stress. But there is good news. As we'll see in chapter 6, the perception of stress is even more important than the type of stress experienced. In fact, our perception indicates how we must respond to it. We can have control when we need it most. A side note before we go into the next section. Kelly McGonigal has an amazing TED talk that reviews stress and how we see stress often and ultimately determines how stress affects us in the body. So if you type in Kelly McGonigal on YouTube and the title of the talk is How to Make Stress Your Friend. You'll be very surprised. This is a revolutionary talk, in my opinion. It really did change the way that I viewed stress and the perceptions of stress and how these can actually change the stressor. Back to the book. Beliefs about willpower. Your perceptions of stress and its effects on the body is as important as the beliefs you have about willpower. Researchers at the University of Zurich, Veronica Job and her colleagues suppose that self-control shouldn't be reliant on the amount of sugar a person consumes, but also on her beliefs about whether willpower would actually deplete if a glucose drink wasn't consumed. Basically, this means that they thought the importance is not necessarily on what you're drinking, what you're consuming, but also what you believe about what that particular thing is having in terms of an effect on you, what kind of effect this is having on you rather. They published a paper in 2013 called Beliefs About Willpower Determine the Impact of Glucose on Self-Control. Pretty self-explanatory in that title pretty much. Let's get back to the book. Job and her colleagues found that the belief 
that willpower would deplete if exercising self-control often led to less overall willpower. The more you thought that exercising self-control would have a negative effect on subsequent attempts at self-control, the less willpower you had. In effect, they found that willpower does not rely exclusively on one physiological resource, namely glucose. Factors such as beliefs about willpower can also affect performance. Why? One reason could be the role of expectation in behavior. Consider the placebo and nocebo effects. Let's consider each in turn. The placebo effect argues that a belief about a particular treatment, exercise, action, medication, and so on, influences the way the brain responds. For example, taking a sugar pill when you've been told it's really a powerful new painkiller can actually reduce chronic pain. Taking an antidepressant that's actually a sugar pill can have the same outcome. The nocebo effect is an identical inverse. If you expect something not to happen, it's more likely that it won't. Let's take a little sidestep here. This is also reminiscent of an expectation bias, a cognitive bias that psychologists talk about in terms of an expectation that we have about something. It's a very powerful, very, very powerful response that what we expect to happen may happen, what we expect not to happen, may not happen. We've got to check these biases at the door and notice when we're getting involved in this mental gymnastics, so to speak. It's also reminiscent of the negativity bias. As humans, we have the propensity to seek out the negative in terms of expectation. We expect the negative to happen more so than the positive. This has an advantage in the animal world because a rustling in the bushes being a predator would save your life and if we choose to pay attention to this rustling in the bushes or other type of potentially noxious stimuli something that might potentially hurt us then we're more likely to survive this is this is the bed and brother bread and butter, not bed and butter, uh, the bread and butter of the negativity bias, expectation bias. And also here, we've got the placebo and the nocebo effects. Let's go back to the book. For Job and her colleagues, the importance lies in the instruction that we shouldn't always be looking at sugary drinks for energy, but more towards cultivating a culture in which people understand that willpower is not highly limited, but rather self-generating. We are the ones responsible for the resources we consume and thus preserve. Willpower is not a tank that empties after exercising self-control, but can be regenerated based on what we believe about ourselves and our actions. Another side comment here, because up until this, this part of the book, We've been talking about willpower as a limited resource, seeing these processes in Baumeister and uh, Vinash's research, as well as Muruvin's research, how this willpower can be depleted. But at the same time, it's important to know that expectation mediates the way that the body consumes that energy. And that's, I think, really important. There's a really interesting podcast episode from the neuroscientist Andrew Huberman where he discusses aggression and he brings to light how testosterone is not controlling for aggression but more rather purposeful movement and energy towards something. Now what that something is is determined by what the person's thinking of at that point in time. So what testosterone can move you towards could be an aggressive tendency, but it could also be uh, working hard at a sport, working hard in the backyard, working hard at your job. That sort of stuff is very important as well. So high testosterone can correlate with something good, can also correlate and work towards causing something, well, probably not causing, it's a bad word, but work towards the association between what your intention is, just like willpower here and the expectations that we have on willpower. A very important distinction to correct. Next section, 
self-control, self-regulation, and willpower. So far we've observed that willpower and self-control are used synonymously in the psychological literature, essentially meaning the ability to forego present temptation for a future focus. We've seen that glucose is important in the exercise of self-control. Let's turn to self-regulation now. Self-regulation can be defined as, quote, the process of managing and changing the self. Now, this particular definition comes from Baumas and Vinash's paper, Uses of Self-Regulation to Facilitate and Restrain Addictive Behavior. Uh, this was written back in 2014. So if you're interested in that, have a look at that paper. Basically, changing your behavior in light of what you'd like to achieve. That's what they're talking about there. This change often relies on consequential thinking. You could stop yourself from swearing at a police officer for fear of backlash, just like you might refrain from lighting up a joint in a public playground because you don't want to be locked up. These are a few examples of when a person regulates their behavior. Regulation is important when a goal is in sight. Managing yourself in light of your goals is an important step to self-improvement, making self-regulation an essential factor for the development of personal well-being. Self-regulation doesn't arise out of a vacuum. What you need is self-awareness. Make a little sidestep here. I've put together a free course online on the academia.edu website on self-awareness. So if you want to understand the neurobiology and psychology of self-awareness, it's great to go ahead and have a look at that one. It's in the show notes as well. I'll go back to the book. This is the ability to know oneself and your surroundings, self-awareness is. It's responsible for understanding how you act in a particular situation, what society expects of you, and what effect you're having on others. Without self-awareness, self-regulation is moot. The more you understand yourself and your surroundings, the more able you are to regulate. And more importantly, Baumeister and Vinash found that Quote, anything that reduces self-awareness will weaken self-regulation. I'm going to repeat that one. Anything that reduces self-awareness will weaken self-regulation. Side comment on this. Former US Navy SEAL Jocko Willink talks about this in terms of regulating his own impulses and his own behaviors. When he is in a tricky situation, he would take a mental step back, kind of like a, almost a literal mental step back, where he would imagine himself watching himself in that situation that he's in right now. And you can do that as you listen to this podcast. You can imagine yourself wherever it is that you are, whether you're running, whether you're you're performing some work, whether you're sitting down, whether you're doing some some chores or whatever it is that you're doing. You can imagine yourself doing that particular action while watching, listening to this episode. And this process in itself takes you out of the experience of listening and gives you an added perspective here. And it's a more self-aware perspective. From a clinical perspective, this is something that I like to facilitate in session when we're processing something that's really tricky. You want to help a, pro a person come to terms with what they're feeling and see what they're feeling as if somebody else is looking at them and noticing what they're feeling. And often this is achieved when a person is able to name their feelings, name what they're going through, name how their positions, noticing what's happening around them. This is self, the bread and butter of self-awareness, to use that word. Again, let's get back to the book. Distraction, drugs, and alcohol, and even excessive emotionality can all impair self-awareness, thus leading to failures in self-regulation. Bringing glucose into the mix, when you experience problems, well, problematic levels of the carbohydrate, you're more susceptible to failures in self-regulation. Without adequate blood glucose, you'll find that you have impaired self-control. Without adequate self-awareness, you're less regulated. Now, this brings us to the 
final section where we're summarizing the chapter in terms of its main points and practical implications. How does any of this consideration around willpower relate to addiction? That's what the next episode is going to be about. The next episode is all about discipline, self-regulation and control. So it's one of my favorite ones because it's the most practical output there. But let's go do a bit of a chapter summary. The main points we discuss where willpower is the energy behind self-control. Self-control is the ability to refrain from current temptation for a future goal. Glucose is an important carbohydrate that gives you the energy to do the things you set your mind to. Things like violence, aggression, tobacco smoking, alcohol consumption, stress, and a lack of attention can often come about when blood glucose levels and metabolism are out of whack. Expectations play a big role in willpower. Self-regulation is the ability to evaluate the pros and cons of a particular behavior and adjust the behavior accordingly. Self-awareness is the ability to know yourself, others, and your surroundings. Willpower, self-control, self-regulation, and self-awareness work together in intricate ways to help keep you at your goals working towards a goal. It's quite a lot of points that we covered in this relatively short chapter, but I like it that way. It keeps them strong and coming. What are the practical considerations of these? Keep your body well nourished for the exercise of energy. Make sure you balance your diet. And that will look different for every single person listening to this. Uh, it's just important to know that a slow release of energy through the foods that you eat is much better than that quick up and down of junk food energy that we tend to get. Next one is remind yourself that positive expectations lead your brain to work better on a goal you've set for yourself. This is an imperative one, as we talked about before. Really adjust how you think about a particular action uh, before you resign yourself to the bias that it is what it is. Remind yourself that these positive expectations can lead your brain to work better. That's an important one. Open your mind, learn more about yourself, listen to others' opinions of yourself, especially if you agree with them, especially if you disagree with them, rather, or repeat that one. Listen to others' opinions of yourself, especially if you disagree with them. This will give you an added self-aware process especially if multiple people are saying the same thing about what you don't believe about yourself consider your impact on others and the way others impact you weigh up the pros and cons in determining the benefit of a particular action consequential thinking that sort of stuff I really appreciate you listening up until this point and so if you have stayed with us and you'd like to support the channel go on over to youtube and hit the subscribe button. It really does help the channel out. Follow me on Twitter. I'm a lot more active in that space, a lot more where I share a lot of the research that I find quite fascinating at that time. And alongside some of my personal views and points as related from a clinical perspective and a psychological perspective. So have a look at that one. Uh, but until next time, next episode, when it comes, we'll be about discipline. Thank you for joining us again today. And I'll see you next time.